past, present, and future Gnosis. It's your host Gnosis, and I'm back with another one. <laughs> it's been a little bit, but I'm glad to be back with you guys. But let's not waste any time and get straight into this video. So now, before I begin, I can't stress this enough. This video is going to be harping really hard on Greek mythology. So if you don't know your Greek mythology or not up to it, you might be a little bit lost in this video. I mean, because what I'm about to explain is this certain mythological, this certain mythical king that the Greeks actually incorporated into their story. And I don't think a lot of people know about this king, <laughs> as you see from the headline memo. But before I begin, like I said, if you don't know your group, you're going to get lost. In. And if you've seen my videos, I harp on so much on the Greeks, even to this day. Look at all the movies that are coming out. It's about Greek gods. I mean, like everything to Zeus, Hera, Aphrodite. If you've seen, I actually made a video about the illusion mysteries when it comes to when it comes to Persephone and Demeter and the importance of these two when it comes to the changing of the season. So, you should really watch that video. But like I was saying, the Greeks, the Greeks are everything and if you do your history which i hope you do you'll s the greeks have their hands in everything and i will be diving deep more about the greeks and their handling on uh some stuff <laughs> as we like the subtuagent but let me harp too far but like i was saying if you don't if you wanted to get more into the greek mythology before we get into it i just want to show you what we'll be starting off from of course, we have Hesod, Works and Days. Of course, this is going to be a big one in this video. Big one, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, we have Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, which actually, Mammon is actually a part of this story. And if you all know about the Odyssey and the Iliad, I mean, these are just works of art and one of the earliest poetry when it comes to Greek around I want to say uh, composed around 9 800 uh, BC and of course I talk so highly about it like this is the Greek that I roll with each and every day and this is what blew my mind and of course is Herodotus histories this is where we get our histories from and when I say when you read her when you read Herodotus everything comes to life so like i wanted to say these are the three books that i want to say it's going to be the core for this video so let me just get that across please because we're about to go in ladies and gentlemen so i want to get that point across but anywho let's get straight into it now so now when you're looking into greek mythology as i was saying before there's so many gods and goddesses uh, like I was saying, Zeus, Hera, Heracles, um, Aphrodite, Demeter, Persephone, Hades. You think all about this, and this is the core of, of the Greeks from their mythology that gives everything of that, well, their actually existence. But when you Look into Greek mythology, and I almost missed this part. There are other gods and go goddesses that you may miss, which I missed myself. But one important person is Memon, the king of the Ethiopians. And this really got my attention because what I was looking into is in how this mythical king fits into Greek mythology I mean, like, everything just makes sense, and it's, it's just crazy. So let's not waste any time and get straight into it. So, Memon, the mythical king of the Ethiopians, one of the most remarkable figures 
in all of ancient mythology is that of Mammon. He was a great hero, not Greek nor Roman, but an African. He was a king of the Ethiopians and he played a critical role in the Trojan War. Mammon was the son of Tethanos, a prince of Troy, and Eos, the goddess of the dawn. And I know, before I continue, if you know your Greek mythology and you're seeing Eos, I know a lot of eyes are already up. They're just like, what? His mother is Eos? Yes. <laughs> yes, his mother is Eos. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> the goddess of the dawn, and that's going to be really important. I will be touching back upon that, but uh, let me continue. According to the legend, the goddess swept the Trojan prince away and took him to the farthest reaches of the earth, known as Oceanius. Hmm. In Greek mythology, pay attention, people will be touching about Oceanius too. The goddess of the dawn bore the Trojan a son. He was referred to as a bronze armored Memon, and he grew up to be a great warrior. Memon enjoyed the great favor of the gods. Hmm, what gods? It had to be the Greeks, of course, and he retained it for all his life. At some point, Memon became the king of the Ethiopians. This was an area due south of Egypt, and it composed not only modern Ethiopia, but also that is known now northern Sudan. Memon ruled a great kingdom and commanded a large army. As a warrior, he was considered to be superior of all the Greek heroes, except for Achilles. Hmm. You know about Achilles. Everybody knows about Achilles being the greatest. Uh, greatest hero in Greek mythology and a key component to the Trojan War. Let me continue here. Some stories claimed that he conquered a great swathe of the east. He was considered to be a very handsome man and possessed all the masculine virtues. It appears that he maintained close ties with the home city of his father. At some point, Memo married a Trojan queen, Trana Neomia. So now, as you can see here, we have Memo being the son of Thetis and Eos, the goddess of the dawn. And already, as I said, I will, I will be talking about more about Eos a little bit later, but you can see that he's already being projected into the mythology of the Greeks. And they made vases upon him, and this story has been marked down for centuries, as we'll all talk, I'll reach about later. But as I said, Achilles and Ramon were both key figures in the Trojan War. And we know about the Trojan War, about how Paris of Troy took Helena from her husband, Maelus, king of Sparta, and sparked all of this to go through. But let's talk about more about the Trojan War and how Memnon has a part in it with Achilles, as you'll see here. Memnon. Leading his army of Ethiopians, arrives at Troy in the immediate aftermath of an argument between Podiums, Helen, and Priam that centers on whether or not the Ethiopian king will show up at all. Memnon's army is described as being too big to be counted, and his arrival starts a huge banquet in his honor. As per usual, the two leaders, Memnon and the case Priam, end the dinner by exchanging glorious war stories, and Memnon's tales lead Priam to declare that the Ethiopian king will be. Troy's savior. Despite this, Memon is very humble and is warns that his strength will. He hopes to be seen in battle, although he believes it is unwise to boost that dinner. Now here's where it gets interesting. Before the next day's battle, so great is the divine love towards Memon that Zeus makes all the other Olympians promise not to interfere in the fighting. I mean, before I continue, Zeus the head of the pantheon of the Greeks lays favor to Memnon and saying that no one could interfere in this fight, upcoming fight between him and Achilles. And before we continue, 
if we really dissect this, Zeus, the head of the pantheons, ladies and gentlemen, giving favor to this Ethiopian king. I mean, like, come on. That shows respect and favor coming from Zeus, if you know your history of Zeus. Coming from Zeus over here. <laughs> the one that freaking be throwing his father, Kronos. I know you know that story for all my mythologies out there. But just notice that what Zeus does. And it doesn't even end there, what Zeus does. But uh, let me continue. Memon kills Nestor's son, Antoclus. After Antoclus has killed Memon's dear comrade, Isia, seeking vengeance and despite his age, Nestor tries to fight for Memon, but the Ethiopian warrior insists it would not be just to fight such an old man who respects Nestor so much that he refuses to fight. In this way, Memon is seen as very similar to Achilles. Hmm, are we getting a comparison, ladies and gentlemen? Both of them have a strong set of values that are looked upon in favorable by the warrior culture of the time. Now here's the fight between them what they say. When Moment reaches the Greek ships, Nestor begs Achilles to fight him and avenge it to close, leading to the two men clashing while both wearing divine armor made by Hephaestus. Hmm, I mean, you don't know about Hephaestus. This is the one who gave all these... Uh, armor, his mythological armor, blessed armor, to both Achilles and Ramon. Remember, they are both have these armors straight from his spirit. So that should say something again, ladies and gentlemen, you gotta pay attention, but let's continue. Making another parallel between the two warriors, Zeus favors both of them and makes each man tireless and huge so that the whole battlefield can watch them class as demigods. Eventually, Achilles stabs Mamon through the heart, causing his entire army to flee in terror. In honor of Mamon, the gods collect all the drops of blood that fall from him and use them to form a huge river that on every anniversary of his death will build a stench of human flesh. The Ethiopians stay close to Mammon in order to bury their leader, are turned into birds which we now call Mammonids, and they stay behind his tomb so as to remove dust that gathers on it. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean like, if you just dissect this story, you have Zeus giving favor to both of these men. Making them demigods fight each other to the death and making making them so big that they're looked upon by everybody else, ladies and gentlemen. This is high praise right now, ladies and gentlemen. Like, just to be featured in this mythology and being Achilles equal, that's what got me. They compare Momo to Achilles, the best. The best of all the heroes. Remember, Achilles, the best of all the heroes. Can't be, can't die. Remember, he was dipped by his Achilles into the waters. Remember, the demigod can't be destroyed only by his Achilles. So, right, that right there just blew my mind when it came to Momo. And it doesn't even stop there. So now, Think of talking about Al Mamon and what he did in the Trojan War and his feats. I wanted to dive deep more into it and see where Mamon derived from. Where was his, or uh, where he derived from? Where did he come from? And if you remember, they talked about Ethiopia so much, and that's where he came from. So let's see more about Mamon here. Mammon in Africa. Roman writers and later classical Greek writers such as Diodorus Siculus believe Mammon hailed from Ethiopia, a geographical area in Africa, usually south of Egypt. Because of the original historical work by Artisanus of Melistone only survives in fragments. Most of it is what is known about Mammon comes from a post-Homeric Greek and Roman writers. 
Homer, as I told you also, guys, which we were getting into, only makes passing mention to Mammon in the Odyssey. Herodotus, as I just showed you the book, his stories, called Susa the city of Mammon. Herodotus describes two statues with Egyptian and Ethiopian dress that some he says identify as Mammon. He disagrees, having previously stated that he believes it to be Cestros. One of the statues was on the road from Smyrna to Sardis. Herodotus describes a car figure matching this description in the old world from Smyrna to Sardis. Ossians describes how he marveled at a colossal statue in Egypt, having been told that Memon began his travels in Africa. And it says here, description here, in Egyptian Thebes on crossing the Nile to the so-called pipes, I saw a statue still sitting which gave out a sound. The many call it Memnon, who they say from Ethiopia overran Egypt and as far as Susa. The Thebians, however, say that it is a statue not of Memnon, but of a native named Famonoth. And I have heard some say that it is Sestris, just like what Herodias was saying. The statue was broken in two by cambias, and at the present day, from head to the middle, it is thrown down. But the rest is seated, and every day at the rising of the sun, it makes a noise. And the sound of one could best liken to that of a harp of a lyre, when the strings have been broken. Before I continue, Herodotus makes this claim of Ethiopia, and I want to get this clear to everybody you have this ethiopian king being called memon being projected into the myth into the greeks mythological stories so where does herodotus say ethiopia is and i want to get this clear for everybody that this is straight out of africa and where does herodotus place it as i'll show you here Ethiopia. The Greek named Ethiopia is a compound derived of two Greek words. According to the Perseus project, this designation pro properly translates in noun form as burnt face and in ejetical form as red brown. As such, it was used as a vague term for darker skinned populations that the Greeks than the Greeks since the time of Homer. Hmm. And if you see down here, before Herodotus, Homer, 8th century BC, is the first to mention Ethiopians, as we have his book, writings that are found at the east and west extremites of the world, divided by the sea into eastern at the sunrise and western at the sunset, of book one of the Lydiad, which we have here. And also, I wanted to show you the map that they display here also. Clearly, you can see what Herodotus was explaining about Ethiopia and expands this whole area. And I can't get on too much Herodotus right now, but he's a Greek historian who traveled all this place, and it's where we get his stories. And he was documenting all these cultures that he came into contact with through his travels. And so let me read this here. The inhibited world, according to Horodotus, Libya, Africa, is imagined as extending no further south than the Horn of Africa, germinating in the uninhabited desert. All peoples inhabiting the southernmost fringes of an inhabited world are known as Ethiopians after their dark skin at the extreme southeast of the continent of Macrobes, so-called for their long longevity. So now, the reason why I wanted to put this out and stress it so much is that, again, if you see my other videos, what Egypt and what Africa did to the Greeks, to the early Greeks, and what they gave them, pretty much their upbringing, is that I made a video saying I made a video talking about the contributions of Africa and you'll see that all these Greek historians 
And all these Greeks came in there learn from the Egyptians, the high priest, the mystery schools, which I will be doing a video about the Egyptian mystery schools because what they taught there is going to be crazy, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let me get, let me get too far. The point is just that these people learned from Africans. Black skin, fair people. And this is no race thing. It's just that you come across this all the time, and some people are not putting it together. Some historians don't want to talk about this, but clearly, as you see in the face and the cover, they are giving this Ethiopian king high regards to Achilles. And I don't know about you all, but that speaks volumes to these people projecting this king into the story and most people want to say oh yeah okay cool i mean it's mythology that's cool but here's the thing is it really mythology because when i was doing this research i came and other scholars actually compare memo to another actual pharaoh, a real pharaoh from the 18th dynasty, and this is what blew my mind, because you know me, ladies and gentlemen, I, when I go in, I go in with my research, I just don't stop there, I was just like, could there be any credi credibility to this mythological story, because I tell you, these stories need to really be dissected, because there are some truths in these stories, even to the Egyptian stories, even to the Romans, and I talk so much about the Greeks, something about these stories that are getting told and retold to the next generation, to the next generation. So, and let me not get too far. So, is there any connection here? So, when I look it up, I see this person, and I'm going to show you that here. Memon. Now, such is the scene in Homer, but the events depicted by the painter are as follows. Listen to this. Memon coming from Ethiopia slays Antigulus, who has thrown himself in front of his father, and he seems to strike terror among the Achaeans, which are the Greeks, of course. For before Memon's time, black men were but a subject for stories. And the Achaeans, Greeks, getting possession of the body, Lamia and Antigulus, both of the sons of Atreus and Adikan and the son of Tydeus and the two heroes of the same name. Again, of the same name. According to Manetho, Maimon and the A Pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, Amenopolis, was one of the same king. So now, we have Manetho, and I'm going to explain who Manetho is, saying that Memon is this pharaoh from the 18th dynasty, and it's the same person they just projected a story about this king. So, when looking into it, I find, I look at, who was Manetho? Hmm. So, who was Manetho, and why is he important? Manetho was a priest who lived during the Ptolemy Kingdom, which was in the early 3rd century BC, during the Hellenistic period. And if you see my videos, I talked highly about the Hellenistic period when it comes to Philadelphia, so what's coming straight from the Seleucid Empire and all of the wars of the, Di wars of the Diadochi after, let me say this again, after the Greeks took Egypt from the Persians in the third century BCE. And around this time, we get the LXX, as I talked, the Septuagint, which another video I talked about, which I won't stress now, but you should watch that video because <laughs> around this time, the Septuagint's being made and Manetho is here too, and you'll see how Manetho gets projected in with the Septuagint. 
But let me continue. Nadab was also considered ancient Egypt's permanent historian because of Akapataka, a work that surveys the history of the kings who reigned in ancient Egypt. Muneto was from Egypt, but he wrote most of his works in Greek, which was the dominant language during that time period. He typically wrote about science, religion, history, and he also helped to decipher the rather lengthy names of the Egyptian pharaohs. This made it easier for more people to understand what they meant, and his system also assisted scholars with matching the pharaohs to their associated kingdoms and they came from. Essentially, Muneto was one of the earliest historians and he served as a linguistic as well. Now that it is time to study the wonderful primary source document of Egyptia, by doing this we will see why it was and is such an important resource for scholars studying ancient Egypt. So why is the work of Egyptia so important and how does it help historians study the past? Well, for one thing, Akatapeka has helped historians who study in Egypt because of the way Manetho organized the many different dynasties. Manetho had two tiered level of analysis when it came to organizing the dynasties, and he did this by compiling them from both a geographical and geological perspective. His method was absolutely necessary due to the expansive history of ancient Egypt, had, which contained between 30 to 31 dynasties that span hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So now, you can see why Manetho is so important for giving the genealogy, genealogy of all the pharaohs that, have, that uh, traverse back all the way to the 18th, 19th dynasties. So they used him to get a certain order of the kings and the pharaohs so that they can have a better list and better understanding. And until this day, we still use this list to understand all these dynasties that came before the third century BCE. So you can understand why Manetho is so important and why I'm gonna use him to better credit what he says, well, who he says is actually Memo. And he actually says that, and if you do the research, he actually, it coincides with Amenhotep the third. And then when you look at Amenhotep the third and the statue that they have for him, it all just connects with each other. So now, let's look at it right now because you all could look this up. Let's do it right now. Colossal of Memon. The Colossal of Memon are two massive stone statues of the pharaoh Amenhotep III, which stand at the front of the ruined Machutori Temple of Amenhotep III, the largest temple in the Theban necropolis. They have stood since 1350 BC and were well known to ancient Greeks and Romans, as well as early modern travelers and Egyptologists. The statues contain 107 Roman era descriptions in Greek and Latin, dated to between AD 20 and 250. Many of these descriptions on the northernmost statues make reference to the Greek mythological king Mammon, whom the statue was then enormously thought to represent. And as you see here, of all these pictures, clearly, ladies and gentlemen, you see all the descriptions here in Egypt. And remember, dating even the Romans contributed to all of these. So now, I want to go a little bit down here and show you all this. Roman era inscriptions. The statues contain 107 Roman era inscriptions in Greek and Latin dated between 20, 20 through 250 CE. It's the time when Jesus was alive, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> These descriptions allowed modern travelers to connect the statue to the classical Greek and Latin literature. Many of the scriptures include the name Mammon. I mean, come on, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'm trying to show, or what these Greeks and Romans are trying to show is they contributed the legendary king of the Ethiopians, Mammon, to Amhentop III. Plain as day, we have inscriptions in stone, ladies and gentlemen, 
cooperating Amihotep the third and him doing all this and if you do the timing the timing somewhat matches up at 1350 BC so this just blew my mind and we're not even done yet ladies and gentlemen because like I said Greek mythology is everything and we have Memon this Amutep the third this real pharaoh being contributed to him but now so now after showing you all about this about Memon about his mythology and how he fought against Achilles in the Trojan War it was actually toe to toe with Achilles when it came to strength and courage as I showed you here and showing you where Memon stemmed from in Ethiopia as in what Herodotus' map shows where it was located uh, towards the northern horn of Africa and that's going to be important because now ladies and gentlemen this is where everything just gets crazy in the Greek mythology if you stayed this long I appreciate you you're a real historian because I know most people never even heard of Memon or heard certain stuff about him because we all think that the elite Iliad just stops there but no there's actually multiple books that actually continue the story most people didn't know that and won't even recognize it and then I had to look deeper because the story just cuts off and I, there had to be some type of continuation so anywho here it is so let's get straight into it so now when it comes to Memon I had to look into his parents as I talked about earlier about Eos and his father hmm Tithonius so let's let's read here Memon son of Eos born in Tithonius according to the ancient Greek poets Memon's father Tithonius was snatched away from Troy by the goddess of dawn Eos it was taken to the ends of the earth on the coast of Oceanus hmm, I'm gonna segue back but remember Oceanus the coast of Oceanus According to Hassad, Eos bore to Thedonis bronze-armed Mamon, the king of Ethiopians and lordly Emethian. Hmm. Who's Emethian? Yes. You'd be surprised. There's actually two brothers. Imwan actually has a brother named <laughs> Emethian. And uh, let me continue with this article, but Emethian is everything. You know, as you see, I mean, there and actually goes close to another Greek demigod that you won't believe the connections, but let me continue. Zephyrus, god of the west wind, like Mamon, was also the firstborn of son of Eos by another father, Astraeus, hmm, making him the half brother of Mamon. According to Quintus Smyrnius, Mamon said himself that he was raised by the Hesperides on the coast of Oceanus. Hesperides, ooh, I know some people's heads just rolled right now. They're just like, what? Momo was in Hesperides? Yes, people, this, this gets crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm saying. You have to do the homework. Let me continue. Momo dwelling on the Western Ocean and his father being driven there would make him the son of Dawn, the East, as in the son of Troy, rather than the son of Eastern Asia, as earlier scholars have proposed based on their opinions. So now, before we continue, let's look into the father and the mother of Mamon and his brother, because this is where things get crazy. So all my, my Greek historians, mythologists, get your hats on, man. We're about to go in right now. So let's look into his father. Tithonus, could just give a quick transcription here. In Greek mythology, Tithonus was a lover of Eos, goddess of the dawn. He was a prince of Troy, the son of King Lobion and Nied. The mythology reflected by the fifth-century vase pairs of Athens and Physiag, Tithonus as 
Rhapsody. Hmm, Rhapsody. As attested by Lear in his hands on an uncular wind jug of the Achilles painter. And when it comes to the, as you'll see on the bottom here, Eos bore Tantinus. Two sons, hmm, Memon and Emathian. According to Quintus Smears, Memon was raised by the Hesperides on the coast of Oceanus. According to the historian Diodorus Siculus, Thetanus, who traveled east from Troy to Assyria and found that Susa was bribed with the golden grappling to send his son Memon to fight Troy against Greek. And now we look at his mother, Eos. In ancient Greek mythology and religion, Eos is the goddess and personification of the dawn, who rose each morning from her home at the edge of the river Oceanus to deliver light and despair. The night. Oceanus, again, we keep hearing that. Now let's look at Eos' children. Eos married a titan Astraeus of the stars who became the mother of Anomia, the winds, namely Cephas, Boris, Notus, and Eros of the morning star. Eos for Venus, the stars, and a virgin goddess justice Astraea. Her notable offsprings were Mammon and Amadium by the Trojan prince Dethinus. So now, after just explaining that Amion does have a second brother, this Amethyst actually, Amethian, intrigues me. Because if you look into Amethian, which they don't really touch about at all, which is weird and I, I think I know why. But let's see who Amethian is and how his involvement is with Greek mythology, as I'll show you here. Emedian, king of Ethiopia or Arabia, the son of Tatinos and Eos, and brother of Amon. Hercules killed him. Wait a minute, Hercules is in the story also with Memon and his brother? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, again, how many of you people ever heard of Hercules going, touch, talking about Memon and his brother? <laughs> Got to do your homework. You've got to do your homework. Hercules had to fight Amethian, who came across the valley of the Nile on his way to steal the golden apples of Hesperides and kill him and gave his kingdom to Mammon. According to a rumor, Amethian wanted to prevent Heracles from stealing the golden apples. A different legend tells that the father of Romus, who funded Rome, was Amethian. So now, if you've been paying attention, I actually said three key points here that Ramon himself said that he was raised in the Garden of Hesperides. Hmm, where have we heard this before, ladies and gentlemen? What are the Gardens of Hesperides? Hesperides. Clear voice man who guarded the tree bearing golden apples that Gaia gave to Hera at her marriage to Zeus. Now, this is really important, people. Listen to this. According to Asso, they were daughters of Erebus and Night. In other accounts, their parents were Atlas and Hesperides, or focus of Keto. So now, I'm going to go a little bit down here. They were usually said to live in west beyond the sunset. But the Greek poet and Grammina Apollonius of Rhodes, 3rd century BC, placed them in North Africa. Hmm, where the Ethiopians are at. Remember now, let me continue. In a mythographer, Apollonius, 2nd century BC, located them at Hyperboreus. The golden apples were also guarded by the dragon, laid them the offsprings of Froser and Kieto. Hmm. So, so now, where exactly does it say in the mythologies, does it say where the Garden of Hesperides is at? As I'll show you here. 
Regarding Hesperides was the location that the Hesperides nests were located. It had a grove of trees that the golden apples of Hesperides. It was also the location of the golden fleece. Oof. Come on, people. This is mythology to its core. There was a serpent laid in the Garden of Hesperides located just in front of where Atlas holds the burden of the sky. And if you remember, where is Atlas located? Wait till you see this, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the map I showed you, as you're seeing here. Look where Atlas is at. Clear as day, the northern realm, northern helm of Africa, right there. So if you look to the east of that, the Garden of Hesperides is right there, ladies and gentlemen, sitting right there in Africa. And before I go any further. What I'm trying to point out is, if you've been paying attention, all this mythology when it comes to Zeus, um, Memon, and even Heracles, and Achilles, are all deriving from Africa. All of it, as I just showed you, the map, as you just saw, in Ethiopia, all of this, and it doesn't stop there but all of this is happening in north africa and this is crazy because if you don't put it together if you don't even really see about emma you would probably not even see any of this at all and that's why most people are going to bypass this and not even know about memo and his brother and how heracles actually killed him as he had to cross the nile river where's the nile river ladies and gentlemen Egypt. I mean, come on. There's the connections. He had to travel through Egypt to get all the way to Oceanus on the coast. And let me show you more about Oceanus here. Both Hesod and Homer locate Oceanus at the ends of the earth near Tartarus in Theogony or near Elysium in the Iliad and in the Odyssey. It has to be crossed in order to reach the dank house of Hades. And for both Hesod and Homer, Oceanus seems to have marked a boundary between which the cosmos became more fantastical. The Deogony has such fabulous creatures as the Hesperides with their golden apples, which I just showed you guys, is right there by Atlas in the northern part of Africa. And as you, as I continue reading here, the three-headed giant Giron and the snake-haired Gorgons all residing beyond glory, glorious ocean. While Homer located such exotic tribes as the Camerians, the Ethiopians. Again, and I'm going to show you the map again, ladies and gentlemen, I can't make this up. All this is in Egypt. And this is a continuation of my last video, just showing you how... Egypt and the northern helm of Africa and Greeks were intertwined, ladies and gentlemen. You've seen the stories, the mythological stories. I just showed you Hesperides and where Atlas is located. The golden apple that gave immortality that Hercules went to go get. Remember the stories, ladies and gentlemen. He had to hold it up there's some stories where he held up Atlas holding up the world so Atlas can go out there and go grab it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is mythology intertwined all in Africa, talking about all about Africa. So I want to present this to you all like that because most people's jaws are like, huh? What? Never heard it like that because no one put it to you all like that. That's the thing. We, we just pass all this and just think it's all stories, but no, there's actually some truth to these stories, ladies and gentlemen. So I just wanted to get that across. And then 
just showing you that all of this happened right here in the North, Northern Helm. What more evidence is it to show you the cave of Hercules? Hmm, what? There's a cave of Hercules? Come on, people. You thought I was going to leave you guys all without more info? <laughs> Come on now. Do your research. Let me show you this. Cave of Hercules. Tanjiro Merkel, along the most northern port in Africa, is an ancient cave surrounded by legends. Along the most northern west tip of Africa, a continent, is an intriguing cave complex steeped in myth and legends. According to the lore, it was even visited by one of Roman mythology's most famous heroes. According to the myth, Heracles, adapted from the Greek Heracles, slept here on his way to steal three golden apples from the Garden of Hesperides. Stealing the apples, which were believed to confer immortality, was the eleventh and twelfth labors of Hercules, according to the ancient writers. The garden was located in nearby Lux, the current city of Lash, at the Atlantic coast. I'll skip here. You won't find Hercules or monkeys with the caves, but they're worth exploring nonetheless. The complex has two openings. The one that faces the sea resembles the shape of Africa and is said to have been created by the Phoenicians. And as you see here, ladies and gentlemen, these pictures, I mean like, wow, come on. Not only do we have mythology backing up this area, Herodotus, which actually visit all this this whole area, Diodorus Siculus, Homer, Homer, Hussard, all talking about this one area in Northern Africa, Northern Africa. I mean, like, come on, people. This goes to show you again the link that the Greeks had with the Ethiopians and the Egyptians too. For them to project them into their mythology says it all. You don't, <laughs> as a group or a little nation, don't put in other cultures into your story and putting them onto the level of Achilles and Zeus granting immortality, immortality to Memon and then Hercules actually going on his way to go get the golden apples had to fight Emon's brother Emathian beat him, killed him and then gave him the control of that area which is Egypt of course and if you can see the parallels there which I won't stress too much for me that shows me the significance of the culture being trans ported down to that all their upper coast for me I may be reaching but that's what I feel like that part is and then Hercules coming to this area and with the garden of Respides Herespides being right there right there I mean it doesn't get any assurance than that ladies and gentlemen I was just like when I found all this out I was just like there it is I got it I knew it I knew it more validation for me I mean, Atlas is right there in front of her right in front of the garden so what I want to say again before I head out this is and I appreciate you all watching this is these stories that we get there is some truth to it it's just a lot of dissecting and um, using different resources but this is history ladies and gentlemen that's not being told in the forefront we're missing out on key history and it's up to us to find these little patches in the history and try to fill it in and that's why I keep saying if you want to know mythology and I'm again my books are right here you can all buy them it just takes a lot of reading <laughs> I'll tell you that a lot of reading but they all lay it out there for you for us all ladies and gentlemen but again Thank you all for taking the time to watch this. I know this video was a little lengthy. 
I had to give it to you all in this type of faction, so I feel like it would hit harder. But um, yeah, like I always said, the Greeks, the Greeks, the Greeks. They'll tell it all into their stories. We have to pay attention to these stories, and I've been touching up on different stories too. As the Egyptian stories, because there's a lot of truth, ladies and gentlemen, that no one's giving it to you. We all think this mythology is all just stories. <laughs> no, these ancients knew something. If you've been watching my channel, these ancients knew something. And they portrayed it in stories. But I mean, I get too long. But um, again, I appreciate you all taking the time to watch this video. What did you guys think? Have you guys ever heard? of this king, Memon, and his brother, and the connection that he has to Greek mythology, being this, being the offspring of Eos, goddess of the dawn. I mean, it doesn't get any, it doesn't get any crazier than that, ladies and gentlemen. And then Zeus granting him immortality, immortality, I mean, come on, come on. But what do you, what guys, do you guys think? think? Let's talk in the comment section. Um, but yeah, anywho, I'll see you all in the next one. And I appreciate you all. All right, guys. Take care.